I have here a stick. Happens to be a meter stick, but you could use any stick. Rectangular, cross-section, round, cross... Indeed, take your broom, your house broom, and cut off the head of the broom, and you have a stick. May give you some trouble, but you'll have a stick. Now, let us say that this stick is a good stick. By a good stick, I mean it's uniform, homogeneous, and isotropic. Oh, those are pretty fancy words, but they describe the stick precisely as I wish it. So I'm going to do as follows. I'm going to rest the finger on the stick here, and it is so rough. I'm going to rest the stick on this finger, and it is equally rough. And I'm going to support the stick first symmetrically. 80 and 20. The stick is thus supported symmetrically. Now I'm going to push my fingers toward each other, and if the roughness here is the same as here, then the fingers should meet in the middle. Watch, and we shall see it's true. Well, the roughness is not identical, but nearly so. And, and, I am pushing both fingers. I am pushing both, and the fingers met in the middle at 50 centimeters. Now I'm going to do it again, putting my fingers at 70 and 30 symmetrically. And the same result will ensue. Now don't think this is trivial, because this is very complicated. As you will see, I'm going to push my fingers toward each other. Again, I started symmetrically, and the fingers meet in the middle. Oh, says someone, the fellow is a stupid old man. He ought to know it is so. But now, what did I say? I said, but now I am going to support the stick unsymmetrically at 70 and at 10. Certainly, these supports are unsymmetric. Now I am going to push my fingers toward each other. And the question asked to, to ask is, what will happen? Is it not logical, is it not reasonable to say that the stick will tip this way? It is so. The stick will tip that way. But now watch, watch, watch sharply. Ho ho, says somebody, Professor, you are not pushing this finger. I am. Because of the paradox of forces we learned about earlier, a force cannot exist alone, they must exist in pairs. I am pushing that finger. No requirement that it move. I am pushing that finger. I am pushing it, I am pushing it, I am pushing it, and now it moves. And the stick did not tip. So there emerges from this place this strange mystic thing of the stick which did not tip. Now, supposing I have a smoother thing than my finger. Here is a metal bar, much smoother. I'm going to put it there. And now somebody says, why, Professor, the stick must tip that way. No, no, it will not tip. It will not tip. And I say, that is mysterious to contemplate. The stick did not tip. And we have to ask why it is so, and I'm going to tell you the mathematics. F is equal to mu n. And so, what am I suggesting to you all? That to understand the behavior of nature, one must learn some mathematics, which is not only good for the mind and the spirit, but for the soul. First, I want to tell you a story which may well be entitled The Case of the Can with Two Holes and Little Sam. It goes as follows and has beautiful physics. On a certain program, I did the case as follows. A can of juice into which I put a hole and from which the juice does not too well emerge. Not at all. Whereupon I put another hole, and now the juice doth much emerge. Look at that. And the path is a parabola. 
And so, having done this on a certain television program, the next day I encountered a little boy by the name of Sam, five years old, with whom I discussed what he had seen. And he said to me, Professor, I'm so very glad you did that experiment with the two holes in the can. I have seen my mother do that because it doesn't come out so good with one hole and comes out very good with two holes. And you know why I'm glad you did that experiment and explained that the stuff needs one hole to come out of and the air needs the other hole to go into? He said, I'm very glad you did that and explained it because it is something I have not understood all my life. Little Sam, age five. I'm going to spin it. Watch me. There it is spinning. Now I'm going to remove the support. Ho, ho! <laughs> you all expected it to fall down, didn't you? And indeed, I can't knock it down. Look at that. I'll sock it and whack it, and it won't go down. I think that's terrific. And that's a gyroscope, about which I have no time here to speak, because it is very complicated. But have I not urged you to learn the mathematics in order to understand these affairs of nature? So I'm going to write the mathematics on the board. <clears throat> That's the Greek letter tau. There it is. And it would take me about six hours to develop that equation to tell you why the wheel does not fall down. I have a letter from a little man, seven years old. It's about half your age, isn't it, Joseph? Yes. Dear Professor, I have used a box of matches for the experiment with the bottle and the eggs. I think that's one. He used a whole bo box of matches, Anderson. Isn't that wonderful? Now, let me do this another way, which is very beautiful. I have here two blocks of glass. And, well, I have to turn a little so I can see them. Is that all right for you, cameraman? Oh, yes, that's beautiful. Now I'm going to prove some remarks that I made earlier. There is one paint, uh, uh, slab of glass. There is one image formed by the front face. There is the other image formed by the back face. Now let me bring up the other slab. And notice I introduce another image. And if it were dark in this place, we'd see several more by internal repeated reflections. Let's try it. There, there, there. I see one way back there. Do you see it, Anderson, in this glass? A little hard for the camera to catch it. Do you see four images? Yes. yes, four images, right. And each one, lights please. Each one increasingly greener suggesting that it is arising from repeated internal reflections in the glass. Now, watch this. There we are. There we are. Beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. 